so our next presenter will be Dr. Ongshuman Goswami. He will be uh, tackling the posterior polar cataract. Ongshuman did his uh, post-graduation from Maulana Azad College and did his fellowship from uh, Germany in ICO fellowship. He has worked in a lot of places in India and he wants to learn new methods and pass them on to his uh, fellow colleagues and pupils. So, uh, Angshuman, yeah. Thank you, Angshuman. Uh, Dr. Shugato, can you hear me? All of you yes, can hear me? Yes, yes, yes. Loud and clear? Yeah. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Shugato and AIOS for giving me this opportunity to uh, speak on this uh, occasion. Uh, as we are seeing great surgeons doing surgery one after another, I'll be uh, showing one of the most difficult cases that one can handle, that is a posterior polar cataract. These cataracts are a uh, challenge in itself and uh, there are a lot of parameters in FACO surgery which we have to actually alter when we are carrying out surgery on these cases. So these are usually congenital cataracts, we all know that they are many times bilateral so one has to be a, a bit aware of that that the other eye may also be having a, a similar situation and accordingly the patient also has to be counselled and all the risk factors are to be taken care of. So they are difficult not only from the surgeon's point of view but from the patient's point of view they cause early glare difficulty in vision so patients tend to come a little earlier than normal uh, to the surgeon for their treatment now why are they uh, more difficult from the surgeon's point of view because uh, it's been seen that there's many times a strong addition of the opacity with a weak posterior capsule in fact, uh, it's been seen that about 26% of the cases may have defective posterior, defective posterior capsule and there's a high rate of intraoperative PC rents, almost 40 to 50% in cases of posterior polar cataract. Taking these into consideration, one has to be very careful and uh, not just during the surgery but preoperatively uh, while counseling the patient. Uh, number one, of course, we have to do the usual cataract workup that we do for all patients. And if we have the facility for a, a you know, UBM or anterior segment OCT or pentacam, we should use it to the full because that way we will have a visualization of uh, the defect in the posterior capsule and we would be more prepared in handling the case during the surgery. But uh, everybody may not have these facilities in his setup and uh, these being very expensive equipment and uh, surgeons uh, all around might not have it. So one simple rule that rule of thumb that one should follow is if one is suspecting it to be a posterior polar cataract then treat it like a posterior polar cataract respect it and don't think it to be a posterior subcapsular and be casual with it so when in doubt always consider a posterior polar cataract so as you can see the pentacam and the asot pictures and here you can see in the asot picture that uh, there's a nucleus matter uh, in fact, the cataract matter coming out through a posterior dehiscence out here. This is often being called a teardrop sign. So, moreover, because of all these factors, it's very important that one should explain to the patient preoperatively that there is a very high chance of having a nuclear drop during the surgery. The surgery is going to be much longer than one would expect uh, in a normal case. So, they should be at least mentally prepared. It may not, but then one should be very clear with the patient because his expectations are skyrocketing nowadays. Secondly, secondary posterior segment intervention should always be explained to him in case there is a complication and they may have a delayed visual recovery. And one important point that one must keep in mind is that patients who have a unilateral posterior polar cataract might have amblyopia. So that aspect also needs to be explained to the patient. A very, very important point from a medical legal point is that make a diagram of how the posterior polar cataract looks and explain it to the patient and also explain it to him that why the risks of surgery are much higher in these cases than a normal cataract. You may even diagrammatically explain it to him that how the nucleus can get uh, uh, dislocated back in the vitreous. Now coming to the surgical aspects, the most important thing that has to be done in the beginning is adjust the parameters of your FACO machine. The FACO machine that we carry out, I have no financial interest in this, but whatever type of FACO machine we carry out, the basic principle remains the same. Do slow motion FACO. Please do not try to be uh, very exploring in cases of posterior polar cataract. Even the best surgeons 
uh, have difficulty doing them. So people who have just started learning FACO probably should avoid doing it themselves. And uh, the parameters to be set for posterior polar uh, cataract is that you should first and foremost lower the intraocular pressure because these cases we don't want too much of pressure to fall on the posterior capsule and break through. Second is we always reduce the aspiration flow rate because we want slow motion FACO. We don't want too much of chamber depth variation by uh, which what can happen, the posterior capsule can move forward and get uh, ruptured. And uh, FACO power usually is kept a little lower side itself because in any case, these cataracts come early and many a times uh, their nucleus is very soft. So, of course, we can keep the parameters at its normal values and adjust it accordingly. Now, I'll show you uh, how ideally a, a posterior polar cataract uh, should be carried out the various steps that are important and uh, we'll start with the video a capsule so, uh, of 5 to 5.5 millimeters can you hear me Shugata? to allow adequate maneuvering space and the option of yes sir yes sir once the section is made the anterior yes, we can is hear you and yes sir it's audible at the deepest level possible is done gently Never do a hydro dissection in PPC as the fluid wave will rupture the PC and there will be a nucleus drop immediately. For the same reason, once demarcated, no attempt is made to rotate the nucleus. The superficial epinuclear plate is shaved off till one loses the nucleus enough to flip it over into the mid pupillary plane where it is completely emulsified. One should never try to remove the posterior plant till the end of a cortex management at any cost. is now peeled off from the periphery to the center, again taking care to emulsify it before it can pull the posterior plate along with it. Always refill the chamber with OVD from the side port before removing the FACO probe from the AC. This prevents sudden AC shallowing and bulging forward of the PC which may cause a PC rupture. For irrigation aspiration, bimanual IA probes are always preferred as the chamber stability is better. Again, it cannot be overemphasized that the cortex is peeled off from the periphery to the center to form a bunch and it is removed with the plug at the end. The iron is then implanted in the usual manner, taking care that the leading haptic does not point towards the posterior capsule while injecting into the back. I'll show you another technique uh, which has been propagated by Vasavada doing a hydro dissection inside out and uh, I've tried to modify it by doing a transverse trenching using a ozil system that we have which can be helpful in uh, avoiding the rotation of the nucleus. I will show you how hydro delineation of the nucleus is done from inside the nucleus. First described by Dr. Abhay Vasavada easier to perform, provides superior control, reduces stress to the zonules and more precise in terms of demarcating the central core of the nucleus. A deep trench is cut in the center of the nucleus using slow motion FACO so as not to rock the nucleus by trenching it. Once trenched to adequate depth, the FACO probe is taken out while simultaneously injecting OVD from the side to prevent shallowing of the anterior chamber. The hydro dissection camera is then introduced to the main incision and the tip is placed adjacent to the right wall of the plate depth, depending upon the density of the cataract. It then penetrates the central lens substance and fluid is injected to the right wall of the trench. To fracture the nucleus further without rotating it, two trenches are cut on either side of the main trench 
using torsional pegu. By using transverse pegu, two clean cuts can be made on either side of the trench without rocking the nucleus to and fro. The nucleus is thus packed into smaller parts without the need for rotation, thus safeguarding the weak posterior capsule from torsional forces. First, and this is how it moves on and of course it uh, continues as it is and uh, we complete the surgery. I'll just share a few useful tips while doing a posterior polar cataract. You can use a, a blunt dissector like an iris repositor to separate out the anterior capsular cortex from the anterior capsule sub, uh, subcortical area. This way you avoid hydro dissection. You can use a Kuglan's hook on viscoelastic to take out the sub incisional epinucleus. Use both hands whenever feasible. Be slow. And most importantly, leave the plaque to be removed for the end. Don't touch the plaque till the end of surgery because that is what is plugging the hole in the posterior capsule. So, uh, to concise and uh, complete the do's and don'ts, always adjust the parameters of the FECO machine. Always adjust the FECO parameters Usman, before starting. I think you have to finish because uh, never uh, put too much of fluid inside the AC and always the AC before going on to the next. Just a moment. Umshuman. If you can yeah. stop sharing because lack of time, otherwise Dr. Prashad will not be able to present. Yeah. Okay, thank you for the thank last you. Thank you very much.